There are so many voices in this country that are speaking up and active, people active in their communities, that I'm not talking about a fringe minority or a silent majority, but the silenced majority, silenced by the mainstream media. The media today represents a minority elite. These all have to be challenged, and many people are doing it. It's Michael Franti here. This is Amy Goodman with Rochester, Rochester Indie Media. Hi, Dawn Zupella here, the Barefoot host with Rochester Indie TV. And uh, I'm barefoot. It's a special uh, barefoot occasion for me because it is very cold out and uh, I'm visualizing having my feet in the earth of an organic farm and the sun and the warmth of the soil. So I'm looking ahead and this show is going to help me get into that space because we're going to be talking about community supported agriculture today with Aaron Bullock. But first I want to talk about community supported TV and that's what Indie Media is. We have a community making this happen and I want to give thanks to this crew that produces this show weekly. Uh, we have Ted Forsyth, Tim Adams, and Susan Galloway on the cameras, and the indomitable Andy Dillon, which nothing would be accomplished from start to finish of this show without him. So thank you guys. And uh, today we're going to be talking about community-supported agriculture. And Aaron, you're going to do that for us. So thank you. Hi. I'm so excited. Yeah. First of all, that you came back. You moved here to Rochester in the dead of winter, well, close to the dead of winter, to uh, visualize something live and beautiful and growing. So let's talk about your transition back and what your plans are and then we'll talk about the CSA. Cool, great. Um, yeah, it's been about 10 years since I've lived in Rochester and experienced the winter. <laughs> and this was a good winter to move back <laughs> into. Where are you coming from? Um, this past year I was in the Hudson Valley, so it was also cold, but um, uh, you know, still a little different. Before that I was in San Francisco in the Bay Area for five six years. Okay, and much better. You know, Winters, Ithaca, yeah. yeah, so I've been abroad and um, originally I grew up in Fairport and you know like most people in my graduating class we all moved off to big cities mm -hmm. but um, I found myself thinking you know I want to I want to start a farm and where would I like to buy land and here is where my family is and I feel like it's just a really good thing to move back home. It's a really good time to do that so so what's your, what, what qualifies you? Well, let's talk about what the plan is, a community-supported agriculture mm -hmm. project. Mm -hmm. what, what does that mean? Yeah, um, it's a really creative kind of way for a farmer and a consumer to sort of have a direct relationship with each other so that the consumer knows, you know, exactly where their food is coming from. They can ensure that it's, you know, organic or, or that it's, you know, safe or, or the workers are treated well um, and just to have that direct link and they can also go to the farm and see how their food is grown there's so many great things for the consumer and for the farmer it's a really great way to you know market direct to the person who will eat your food uh, you don't have to go through a middleman there's no huge shipping costs and, and you know retail grocery stores taking cuts and and so it's a really great marketing way for farmers to make a living these days. And it is really hard for small farmers to, to make a living with the, the flood of um, really cheap food from abroad that's now in the marketplace. But this isn't a new idea, really. This has been around for some time. How it's long? It's been around about growing? 40 years. Um, it started in Japan, actually. Huh. And um, some women there you know, got together and organized this because of concerns about the quality of their food, environmental things. So they started this movement. Uh, it spread to Europe and then it spread here in about the 80s. So mm. it's, you know, been around for about you know, 25 years. And are they still growing? Are the numbers of uh, CSA oh, yeah. farms yeah. growing right the now? The estimate right now is there's about 1,300 farms around the country, mm -hmm. but estimates sort of are as high as 3,000. They don't really know because there's a lot of small farms starting up and there isn't really an overall community supported agriculture organization. It's sort of people um, take this idea and then make it their own and fit it to their specific farm. So. 
And um, <clears throat> what gives you background to do something like this? This is a very ambitious project to become yeah. an organic <laughs> farmer. You might want to have some experience previously, or is this just? Yeah, um, I started out my uh, early career. I was, you know, a plant geek. I loved working with plants. Um, so I was working at Wayside Garden Center out in Macedon <laughs> in summers. Um, I went to Cornell University to study, um, first I went in studying plant science and then I realized I didn't want to be in a lab, that was too much, you know, I went towards genetics and stuff and, and then I actually got my degree in landscape architecture so that was, you know, a way for me to work with plants and then be creative and, and so I worked as a landscape architect <coughs> for a while and as a landscaper um, and it took me, you know, many years because I didn't know any farmers and there are no farmers in my family. Um, it took me, you know, a long, a long journey to be able to realize that farming could be a viable career. And then as soon as I realized that, I was like, I got to go work on a farm. I got to go find a mentor who can teach me this. And so I did a one year apprenticeship out in California after I left San Francisco. Um, was that on a CSA or an organic It was on farm? a really large organic CSA. Um, they also did other markets and things like that, but um, that was just, you know, an exposure to all sorts of different things. They had fruit trees, you know, nut trees, sheep, cows, you know. Mm. It was a really great experience, but then I really felt the pull back to the East Coast. So when I came out here, I looked all over the state for a mentor who, you know, could help me, you know, start up this farm out here and could really teach me how to grow vegetables in this climate because it's very different growing vegetables mm -hmm. in California than out here. And less of a season um, time. Like less of yeah, a time. yeah. And so I did find <laughs> some, um, this really great farmer, David Hamilton, in the Hudson Valley. And mm -hmm. he's working on a, a small CSA farm there. It's been around a, about 10 years. And, um, and he's just incredible mentor, you know, talked me through everything from tractor work to planning out crops and, you know, thinning beets by hand. So he, he worked side by side with me and, and there was about three of us working on that farm full time, him and two apprentices. And uh, we fed over 200 families. Wow. It was a beautiful well, Where's your land going to be and how did you go so about acquiring yeah, this land? I, I came back here and I looked all over sort of the eastern side of Rochester because that's where I grew up. Um, and I, I looked at a lot of pieces and they weren't right, but um, uh, I actually found a man named Robert Holmes who lives in Victor and I found him through another farmer who knew about him and he's been looking for somebody to farm his land organically. Hmm. Um, and it, he's an old farmer who's farmed that land for 50 years. Uh, you know, just, just really looking for somebody to take it on. So I'm leasing that land from him. And we're going to talk more about that, and we're going to show some pictures, too. I heard you had some, brought some pictures yeah, about, yeah. You know, from the land. So we're going to look at those when we come back. You're watching Rochester Indie TV. Check us out online. We have a website, rochester.indymedia.org. And our show airs uh, two times a week on Monday at 6.30, and again on Thursday at 8 p.m. So check us out and stay tuned. We'll be back with Aaron Bullock talking about community-supported agriculture. Here you go, Leo. Oops. Leo. Who are you? And how did you know my name? I am Mufius, and I know a lot about you. Have you heard of the Matrix? The Matrix? Do you want to know what it is? Okay. The Matrix is all around you, Leo. It is the story we tell ourselves about where meat and animal products come from. This family farm is a fantasy. Take the blue pill and stay here in the fantasy. Take the red pill and I'll show you the truth. Welcome to the real world. Wow! What is this horrible place? This is a factory farm, Leo. Places like this are where most eggs, milk, and meat come from. How did this happen? I'll show you. In the mid-20th century, greedy agriculture corporations began modifying sustainable family farming to maximize their profits at great cost to both humans and animals. 
factory farming was born. Animals are packed as closely together as possible. Most never see sunlight, touch ground, or get fresh air. Many can't even turn around. These cruel conditions cause fights and disease amongst the animals. To fix this, the corporate machine began systematic mutilations, practices such as debeaking chickens. And they started adding a constant dosage of antibiotics to their feed just to keep these poor wretches alive. This overuse of antibiotics breeds super strains of resistant disease-causing germs. Every day we get closer to an epidemic that cannot be stopped. You're watching Rochester Indie TV, and today we're talking with Aaron Bullock about community-supported agriculture. And uh, Aaron is becoming now an organic farmer. It's a transition for you and um, quite a big project. You were talking about the land. How much land are you going to be cultivating? Well, next year, since it's just me, um, I am going to be cultivating two and a half acres. Two and a half acres. Which is a really big garden. And how do you go so. about, uh, you, you were talking about the relationship with this farmer who wanted his land um, cultivated organically. Mm -hmm. is he, has he been an organic farmer or is he yeah. trying to transition? For oh. 50 years. He He's was certified before people even knew what organic was, which is totally rare to find. And Be he's, he's really great, he's really knowledgeable. Um, he's 82 years old right now, but he's still out on the tractors and he still wants to farm, but you know, he's getting to that point where he realizes he needs, you know. So he, it sounds like he's looking for someone maybe to pass the torch to, that he Possibly. can really trust yeah. with more of yeah. his land. And so he gave me um, four acres, we signed a lease for four acres for next year. Um, he leased it to me for nothing next year as a trial, because he really believes in the, what I'm doing. And to become a USDA certified organic farmer, those are those some pretty stringent, complicated. You have to have like an inspector come out, and it's a pretty rigorous process, and you have to record every single thing you're doing, which is a good practice anyway. Um, it's something I might look into in the future. Well, he's already certified, so doesn't that give you because the land is the land was certified, but he's he's had the land fallow for six years. Okay, he hasn't yeah. been growing. So, what do you plan to uh, cultivate and grow? To then? grow everything yeah. I can, um, vegetable wise. The, really? um, the only fruits I'll have next year are melons, watermelons, and cantaloupes. But um, in terms of vegetables, there'll be, you know, onions, potatoes, tomatoes, broccoli, lettuce, you know, any vegetable you can pretty much imagine. Are you finding you can grow pretty much anything, or are there certain things that you can't grow in this climate? Oh, like soil? compared to California? Yeah. <laughs> like I guess. maybe artichokes. I might try to grow artichokes, but I think that they're not so. Good. Or sweet potatoes, we also tried last year, but I think they're more of a southern crop. Huh. Um, but a lot of stuff you really can grow. You just got to pack it into five or six months. So when are you so. going to start breaking ground? Well, as soon as the soil dries out, um, with organic farming, soil is sort of the basis of, of everything. So if you go in when the soil is still wet in the spring and say the snow is melting and it's raining, then you really damage your soil. So you have to wait until everything dries out to... to start plowing. So it really depends on how much rain we yeah, get Yeah, I'm the predicting, spring. you know, April, hopefully beginning of April. Well. And this is all volunteer-based. So you're running this project, but you're getting it all based on volunteers working for food, basically. Yeah, it's yeah, a work are, for food exchange uh -huh. program. The way I'm setting up the CSA is I'll, I'll have about 50 or 60 members. Um, and there's two ways to become a member. Of course, I need, you know, a majority of those members to pay a share price and that'll help cover my tractor cost and other expenses the greenhouse and and uh, you know pay for utilities and stuff um, but a small portion of those members are going to be a work trade member and they're going to come out and make a commitment of at least 80 hours over the season um, you know come out about once a week and they will be my study crew, and they, they will... have to get up early, right? Like yeah, four or five in the morning, and get out to the farm. <laughs> well, not that early. Okay, <laughs> seven, good. eight. Yeah, you know. it's real work, though. But uh, but yeah, it's real work, and they'll get their hands dirty, and they'll learn how you know production agriculture works, and and you know tips for, you know, hopefully I would love to train, you know, the next generation of farmers, train you know people who want to change careers, and maybe because I think I think growing food is an important thing to do right now and you know with the economy like it is I think we got to come back to the basics and this is uh, a really important thing. And you've had two meetings this past week one was for the volunteers it sounds like you're almost all set with the volunteer portion yeah. for this year because people are really eager and interested in doing that and then you had another one for the general buyer uh -huh, buy a uh -huh. share and the numbers seem to exceed what you anticipated of interest. Yeah I w the meeting last night was about 60 or 70 people 
and uh, and a lot of them handed their checks and application forms to me, so it's filling up really fast. Do you think um, you're going to be turning people away? I think in a couple weeks I could be yeah posting on my website that we're full. And what is the share price? What are people going to get? Four hundred and eighty dollars for the whole season. For the whole season, that's twenty weeks of food. Um, every week you get. You come to the farm to pick it up, but you get seven to ten items of produce. So, you know, a bunch of broccoli or a pound of beans or a bunch of carrots is an item. So. Mm -hmm. so it's a lot of food. And so a lot of people are finding people to share with, you know, couples who don't have kids are pairing up with their neighbors and they're buying a share together. So, mm -hmm. And what is the um, advantage that you see, like just eating and buying locally, you know, compared to, like, you know, some people want exotic things or more interesting yeah, fruits yeah. or vegetables, but is there a reason not to buy those kind of things? Um, I would say, like, it definitely is a challenge to eat locally, but I think that it's a real adventure, too, and you discover things like, you know, kohlrabi or or rutabagas or something that you thought like you never would like or that you had never heard of and you come up with recipes because these grow really well in this climate. Well you got me challenged with so. kohlrabi. What's a oh, kohlrabi? You don't even have to cook it. You just peel it and cut it up and then use it to dip. It's a vegetable? Something. Yeah. Oh, you <laughs> Okay, I have to admit, I don't know what a kohlrabi is. Do you all know what a kohlrabi is? Come on, am I the only one? I asked you... that last night and, and half the people were like, oh yeah, that's kohlrabi. Really? Kohlrabi. <laughs> yeah. Could you describe it? I'll look for it. Yeah, <laughs> it's, um, it's basically related to broccoli, but instead oh. of making the broccoli flower, it makes a really big bulb on its stem, sort of. So if you ever tasted a broccoli stem, you know, not yeah. like the really pithy hard part, but like a crisp, tasty one. Mm -hmm. It's basically like a, a round root sort of version of it. Well, this is reminding me when one <laughs> of my, uh, you know, which I try not to do, but the whole 2009 res resolution things, I wanted to eat more vegetables. And I think this might be a yeah. good way to do it because I get really excited when you can grow it and taste it. There's something so fresh about it yeah. and you see and it. And it's, it's picked just within 24 hours so and then it's wonderful. on your plate. Um, yeah, there's just, there's so many great things about eating local. You know, one is just that it's so much fresher, so the nutrient levels um, are higher than if they were imported from California or something. Um, you know, just knowing that it's grown organically is healthier too. You don't have the risk of pesticides. Um, and then also belonging to a CSA is more than just food. It's more than, yeah, I'm getting my groceries for the week. It's, it's the opportunity. I invite all of the members, whether they're doing the work trade or they're paying the full share, mm -hmm. um, Everyone's invited to come out to the farm. There'll be, um, you know, onion planting harvest festivals and and uh, potluck dinners and picnics, and, and anyone can come out and. And help out, we're going to so. talk more about it when we come back. We're going to give you Aaron's website and more information about how to find the farm, and uh, and we'll figure out what else we're going to talk about. And stay tuned. You're watching Rochester Indie Media's Indie TV. And you can check us out online, rochester.indymedia.org and cable channel 15, Mondays at 6.30 and Thursdays at 8. We'll be back with Aaron Bullock talking about community-supported agriculture. Ew! What's that smell? 12 million pounds of excrement. This pollutes the air and groundwater. That's why communities near factory farms often suffer from high levels of related sicknesses. Well, it smells like shh. And what's more, factory farming corporations have been destroying communities and mistreating their workers for decades. Since 1950, over two million small hog farms have disappeared. If they continue at this rate, there'll be no real independent family farms left. That is the Matrix, Leon. The lie we tell ourselves about where our food comes from. But it's not too late. There is a resistance. Count me in! So how do we stop a Mufius? We are going to spread the word. But it's you, the consumer, who has the real power. Don't support the factory farming machine. There's a world of alternatives. I'll show you what you can do to escape the Matrix. Hi, Dawn Zapelli with Rochester Indie Media's Indie TV, and today we're talking with Aaron Bullock about community-supported agriculture. And Aaron, what I'm interested in knowing is the interest was so high, the numbers were high, you just started this, you put the call out. Um, 
is the interest related to the, some of this economic crisis right now and the recession and maybe people thinking that they'll save money, they can work and mitigate some of the costs for food or get more food than, you know, for their, for their money than you would get at the supermarket? Or what do you think about that? Yeah, I think, um, I think that's all on everybody's mind right now. Um, I think that, you know, when it comes down to that, people would be buying less furniture and less new cars and food becomes a central issue. Um, and, and plasma TV priority again mm -hmm. yeah so and and the fact is like you know the food I'll be offering will be pretty bountiful in the summer and and I also do you pick opportunities so you can go out and pick as many cherry tomatoes as you want or something and you know you go to the store and, and food prices have been rising in the grocery stores um, things are costing more and more and I think as we see food in the grocery stores um, most of it comes from California mm -hmm. and actually organic food, there's this study that was done that organic food travels farther from the farm to your plate. Mm -hmm. um, so most of that is being grown in really large organic farms in California right now. Um, are there other organic CSAs in this area? There are, yeah, there are three or four. Okay. Um, I think that there could be a lot more. A lot, it could sustain a lot more. And that the demand is, is really increasing. And then we so. wouldn't have to travel our food so far yeah. to get to it. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because you, if you're in like the co-op or some of the natural food stores, mm -hmm. the fruit does seem like smaller than, I hate to say it, but if you go into Wegmans sometimes, like their organic stuff, and I don't know if it's because of yeah. the monocropping organic like nature that they have access to compared to like smaller farmers and yeah. that maybe it sits longer and they can't just throw out food that's like wilted or become, you know, um, so what do you think about that? I mean, the you're saying like the quality of organic food seems to be a little less or well, and shiny. It, for smaller yeah. businesses compared to even like larger supermarkets, how can you maintain that? Mm -hmm. You know, by I don't think organic food has to look at all different than commercial food. I think it has to taste a lot better and it will taste a lot better, I, I believe. But, um, you know, I worked with this guy, David Hamilton, in the Hudson Valley last year and his produce was super shiny and big and bountiful and, and he didn't spray a thing. He was completely organic. Um, I think it's, it's just a management issue and and I hope that I can, you know, practice what he's been practicing and, and make that work too. What do you do? I mean, how do you handle the loss then on the organic farms when you don't use these chemicals and sprays? Which yeah, are like pest, pest and disease, yeah. yeah. Most of it is, is focusing on the soil and the health of the soil and the ecosystem. And a huge um, thing that organic growers do is they rotate their crops around. So versus a large, you know, broccoli farm will just grow broccoli. And so the broccoli cabbage worm will come and eat all of the broccoli and they'll, they'll have to spray something for it. But if I grow a row of broccoli next to a row of tomatoes, next to a row of onions or something, um, it will sort of confuse pests and maybe a lot of those cabbage worms won't find the broccoli. Mm. And so there's a lot of little tricks that organic farmers can do. It also maintains the soil, organic farms, yeah, right? Yeah. When you have Rotation the diversity of crops. Yeah, and, and cover crops and just feeding the soil with compost. It's all about preventative strategies and less about, let's just spray a fix-it pesticide. Mm -hmm. Do you think people are becoming more aware of this now, like these pesticides and chemicals and the demand is growing and people want to be connected to their food? Is it just a burgeoning I thing? I think so. I've been reading a lot of articles about it. There's a lot of new books out. Michael Pollan, Barbara Kingsolver, kind of the on the forefront of the local food movement. Um, I think that people really are are starting to look at their diets, you know, also with the health crisis and more people getting, you know, mm -hmm. diabetes and obesity. I think people mm -hmm. are looking seriously at what they're putting in their bodies and, and you know, when it comes down to it, fresh vegetables are, are on the top of everybody's list of what they should eat, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, how can people get involved? I mean, if, if you might cap out, and I know people, you still have a need, yeah. so people yeah. can do the shares and get involved. Well, yeah, in, in the next way. couple of weeks, um, I anticipate a lot of new members wanting to sign up, and I will have to cap it. But, um, but if you're interested in becoming a member of the farm, you can go to my website, and on there, there's an application form. You can print it out and send it in with a check, and that, that's uh, going to hold your membership. So you can also feel free to call me or email me about any questions you have. And you're getting a diverse um, group of people coming to you mm -hmm. from all over yeah. the area, not just from the city or? From the city and the surrounding suburbs and people all the way up to Ontario. I think that's a little far to drive for your uh -huh. vegetables, but <laughs> um, I'm encouraging people to really carpool and take turns. And I won't be doing a drop off. A lot of people have sites where they drop off. As 
the farm gets larger, I may do a drop off in the city. What about or uh, vegetable stands or going to the market? Are you going to be doing that? Because one thing I do notice mm -hmm. is um, the market, unfortunately, which is amazing, our public market is. Um, often not organic and yeah. so you have all these amazing vegetables but they're not organic can you provide something there yeah a lot of people have asked that i think that um i'll see how the season goes and uh i'm gonna plant i'm gonna plant extra obviously it's my first year and i'm gonna make sure that i have enough for everyone but uh csa members will definitely get first priority and so i'm not making any commitments to markets or selling anywhere else so that i can make sure that all of my csa members are happy mm -hmm. That sounds good. Well, what else should people know about this? I mean, what last things do you want to tell the viewers out there who maybe haven't, are just like learning about this or new yeah. to these ideas of farming and agriculture and thinking about their food? What else do we have to keep in mind? Um, I just think it's a great thing. I think that knowing where your food comes from is an important thing for everyone. Um, and I think, you know, when you start to get out and, and get your hands dirty, whether you're growing vegetables in your backyard or, or you're coming out to, to help on the farm, um, or even just visiting the farm, um, I think it gives you an experience of, of really getting you know back to nature a little more and back to what's real after, after uh, you know what's going on in the economy and the world right now. I think that it can be a really rewarding experience for everyone. So. And the whole aspect about the community sounds so exciting. People working yeah. together, like Kids, going out yeah. together. You have yeah. everybody there. Like maybe we could have parties and bonfires oh, and yeah, like a solstice celebration. And, and uh -huh. yeah, I hope that that maybe yeah. could be open to the broader community if people have yeah. like a work relationship yeah. there. Yeah, I, I, I want to do workshops that. like on, you know, making sauerkraut or something or, you know, I love sauerkraut, but we could do like, uh, yeah, all sorts of workshops. That would be fun. And kids are always welcome on the farm. But most of the training is hands-on. You don't really do the workshops previous to people coming, or are the volunteers required to come to some workshops before they actually start? With the no, the training is just going to be on, you as know, the, as on the, the farm. Day. Come out, and I'll, I'll show you how to... What to do next. Pick tomatoes. Wow, that sounds really <laughs> exciting. Well, good luck with this project. Thank it's you. really ambitious, and this area really needs this. And thank you for moving back, because that also means that you're committed to the area, and that's what we like, people who have these yeah. long-term visions to like keep this area so vibrant and sustainable. So thank you, and thanks for coming on our show. And uh, we've been talking with Erin Bullock today, uh, who is going to be um, starting her community-supported agriculture organic farm in Victor. So check out her website. And and buy a share and please get involved and also get involved with um, Indie Media. We have a lot of need for people to come and help us produce our program weekly, to write articles for our website. We have a terrific website. We need, always need more writers, more photos, more readers, so check it out, rochester.indymedia.org and check out Indie Media's Indie TV Mondays at 6.30 and Thursdays at 8. And again, thank you, Rochester Indie Media crew, Ted Forsyth, Tim Adams, Susan Galloway, and indomitable Andy Dillon. Peace.